Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's 2017 Hurricane Preparedness Webinar, a second webinar offering for the 2017 hurricane season. My name is Mike Russis. I'm the Chief of Response and Field Services here at MEMA headquarters, and I'll be today's moderator. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. All participants have been placed on mute. As you will note in today's agenda, we have a compact and comprehensive agenda, and as such, we'll be taking questions throughout the webinar via the chat feature under the notes box in the lower right-hand corner of your browser. Please send your messages to David Bryant, our co-host. David will then post questions and comments for our speakers who will either address them during their presentation, at the end of their presentation, or during the wrap-up at the end of today's webinar. And in front of you, you should have the, uh, the link where to find, uh, where to post your questions. And again, send those messages to David Bryant, and he'll coordinate with today's speakers. Should time permit, at the end of the webinar, we'll open it up for questions where I'll provide you additional directions on how to ask your questions over the phone. In addition, should you have an additional questions or need assistance, assistance after this webinar as you think about preparing for this year's hurricane season, you'll be able to follow up with today's speakers where contact information will be provided during the webinar. Finally, after this webinar, all of today's presentations will be posted on the MEMA website in addition to a link uh, for the recording for this webinar today. To kick things off, I'd now like to introduce Kurt Schwartz, the Director for the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency. Director. Thank you, Mike, and uh, thank you to the 112 people that are online right now, and we anticipate that number will go up. Um, at, at the top of this webinar, I want to uh, thank our MEMA staff for uh, putting this webinar and its content together, but more importantly, or as importantly, I want to thank our uh, three great partners, the National Weather Service, the National Hurricane Center, and FEMA for partnering with us in this webinar, and you will be hearing from uh, the Weather Service Hurricane Center and FEMA um, uh, shortly. Um, before we get into the content, you know, I want to remind everyone that um, August and September have traditionally or historically been uh, the uh, two months of hurricane season um, that are uh, most impactful on New England. Uh, so if we had to pick two months where we historically are at greatest risk of being impacted by a tropical system, it's August and September. Um, August is now just a week away, which means that um, hopefully you are well into hurricane preparedness work uh, within your organizations and communities. Uh, August is only days away, but on the other end, uh, when we get out of September, it doesn't really mean that uh, we can uh, turn off our concerns about hurricanes um, because, you know, we think back uh, over the years um, it storms in uh, October and November happen, um, uh, so the risk does not end at the end of September. Um, one other or two other uh, quick comments. Um, people often ask, well, how busy of a season is it looking to be, or how busy is it already? Um, in terms of our risk uh, and what we need to prepare for, um, it doesn't really matter whether it's a busy season with lots of tropical activity or a slow season with very little tropical activity because in the end it only takes one tropical system to move up the coast and hit New England to cause uh, significant impacts. Um, so. If this turns out to be a quieter than normal season over the weeks ahead, um, don't let your guard down. Um, and finally, as I said earlier, just encourage people to uh, realize that now is the time to prepare yourselves, your agencies, your organizations, and your communities. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Mike Russis, who will 
MC the webinar going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Director. And first on our agenda will be a presentation on the Southern New England Tropical Cyclone Climatology and Threats. It is my pleasure to introduce Bob Thompson, the meteorologist in charge of the National Weather Service Taunton Office, and Matthew Belk, the senior forecaster for National Weather Service Taunton. Bob and Matt. All right. Thank you very much. and 30 uh, uh, participants at this point. Um, it has been over 25 years since the last true landfalling hurricane in New England, and no one knows for sure, but I would be willing to put a little money down. We probably won't get past another 25 years before we deal with a, a direct landfalling a hurricane in New England, when you look back at our history. So it's a matter of time, matter when, not if. I have been uh, a manager of the National Weather Service's uh, Weather Forecast Office for Southern New England since late 1989, quite aware that we get a variety of different types of hazardous weather throughout uh, uh, the Commonwealth. Uh, but of them all, if there's one that could keep me up at night, it certainly would be a, would be a hurricane especially a special concern along the coast, but these are not just coastal storms too, with the flooding rain and the high wind uh, hazard potential inland um, communities, that are even well inland, have to be uh, prepared as well. So we've got uh, some very, very good information ahead with regards to our preparation, and uh, I do hope that uh, we can uh, keep your attention. Matt Belk, uh, who's our hurricane program uh, leader from our office, will um, uh, start taking us through that. Matt? Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, so just the objectives for the next, uh, hopefully, 15 minutes, we're going to briefly review the climatology of tropical cyclones in southern New England, and we'll also review the, uh, the hazards and potential impacts. Uh, to just follow up on something that Director Schwartz mentioned, August and September, as you can see on the graph here, are our peak months of risk, um, but we've also had some uh, storms in May, and we've even had some tropical storms that uh, come in early November. So uh, the, the typical season runs from, the official season runs from June 1 to November 30, but uh, really we're, we're getting into the heart, of the heart of the season now for southern New England. So taking a, a little closer look at some climatology, we're going to look at a return period of a hurricane. And really what this is is the average frequency of a hurricane passing within 50 nautical miles, and you start seeing numbers like 13 at Nantucket as you head towards uh, Western Connecticut along the coast, it's more like 20. So what does this really mean? If you were to look at a 100-year period, you would expect to see five to seven hurricanes hit uh, the southern New England coastline. Once you start getting up towards down east Maine, you're, you're talking more like one or two in a century. So this really is not something that happens with any great frequency. When we start talking about major hurricanes, uh, now you start seeing numbers, you know, the minimum number is uh, 52 there out towards Block Island. Uh, so again, what we're really talking about is a very infrequent event where you're only looking at one or two occurrences within a 100-year period. So uh, we've recently completed a study. Uh, we looked all the way back through the tropical record in the Atlantic, going all the way back to 1851. And we've identified all of the storms that had some kind of an impact on southern New England. You see all those little uh, red crosses there, they kind of indicate where a storm has been when it was within five days to landfall. And these all storms include tropical storms, hurricanes, post-tropical cyclones, which are just simply storms that have become more like a nor'easter, but they were at one point tropical. And the things that I really want to point out on this map, um, you see that uh, you know five days out, uh, a lot of storms are the mean position, which is the yellow arrow, is right around the Bahamas. And that's kind of your first tip. Anything with a name near the Bahamas should have your immediate attention. You should be paying very close attention to that forecast. The other thing you'll see with the mean position is that it, uh, it tends to drift a little bit more northeast and gets into that corridor, say, between the Outer Banks and North Carolina, the Bahamas, and the coast of Florida. Uh, you'll also hopefully see when you look at the times 
but it tends to move really slowly. You know, it takes two days to move from, you know, a central pos position in the central Bahamas to an average position of the northern Bahamas. But then it really starts to accelerate. Uh, by the time it passes the Outer Banks, it's, it's typically moving uh, much faster. So the average speed of a landfalling hurricane along the south coast of the United States is roughly 10 to 15 miles per hour. The average speed of a landfalling hurricane in southern New England is closer to 35. So with the idea being it's all about preparation, 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 you need to be cognizant that as these storms are starting to accelerate up the coast, your time for preparation and completing preparedness actions is going to be considerably less. So when we take a look at uh, this position here, if we remember from the previous map, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of give you the answer, the average position would say you're probably about 24, 36 hours away from experiencing impacts. But just as a rhetorical question, how long do you think it would actually take for the impacts to be experienced in Worcester, which is the yellow square? And the answer is it's already happened for a while now. And I show this graphic uh, for those who, who care. This was actually the 1938 hurricane. I show this graphic because we tend to focus on this is the position, this is the position, this is where the eye is. A hurricane is not a point. It is a process, and that process covers a, a rather large area. So we need to be cognizant that not to just focus on the eye or focus on the track, but we need to focus on when the impacts are going to arrive, and it's quite often well before the actual eye. So what are some of the hazards uh, that we would deal with with a tropical uh, cyclone? And a big one is going to be rip currents. And this is a sneaky one because it occurs more than often, more than 1,000 miles in advance of a tropical system, depending on its size and intensity. And I, I call it sneaky because the weather is great where we are. You could be down on the Cape. You could be at South Beach on the Vineyard. You could be at Horseneck Beach. And you're going to wind up with a, a risk to life uh, just because of rip currents. And the shallow beaches perpendicular to the swell motion, which is pretty much anything that's ocean exposed on the south coast of Massachusetts. Uh, so the hard part is, is taking preparedness actions when the weather is quote unquote not bad. Uh, so we would, this, is a, this is one that we really need to pay attention to. I wanted to show this graphic here. Uh, Massachusetts has two types of coastal shelves. We have a shallow shelf. This is the south coast of Massachusetts. And as you see from the, the image on the, on the left there, uh, it tends to result in lower waves, but that means that the surge is higher and it travels farther inland. And then you get the, the steep shelf, which is the east coast of Massachusetts, and that is more uh, high waves and uh, beach erosion. That would be uh, the concern there. Storm surge can be tremendous, particularly on the, the south-facing bays. Uh, wave runup can cause coastal flooding to be as much as six hours before the eye comes ashore. This has implications for not only just the wind, but sometimes coastal evacuation routes can be uh, removed from use because of, uh, because of coastal flooding. Historically, we have seen surges of uh, 12 to 15 feet, but there's potential for 20 to 30 foot surges from a Cat 3 storm in, in Buzzards Bay. So for those of you who have seen slosh before, that stands for Sea Lake Overland Surge from Hurricanes. Uh, you typically would use that to get the uh, maximum of maximums or the moms of maximum elevation of water. So what I've done here is a little bit different. This is for a Cat 3, and this is potential inundation above ground level. So if we look in you know, the Marion, Wareham, down towards the Cape Cod Canal, you're seeing potential for 25 to 30 feet of, of surge in that area, and that's just all due to the, to the shape of the coastline. But then as you start heading west towards uh, Westport, uh, New Bedford, of course, there's the hurricane barrier there, uh, you can still see potential for really large uh, surges. Even uh, traveling far upriver, up the Taunton River, you look out towards uh, Taunton and uh, Bristol County, you're seeing potential for 12 to 15 feet of backwater flooding uh, if the storm were to hit us just right. So if we move a little farther north up the coastline there, and we start taking a look at uh, Cape Cod, 
into Boston. Uh, Boston, if we had a, a sandy scenario, which was a little, a little farther north, you're looking at uh, potential surges even up the, the Charles River there of uh, 25.8 feet, and that's presuming that the, the Charles River Dam could not be closed. But even on the Mystic River up to the north there, you're still looking at 15 to 20 feet of surge. Uh, I point out Cape Cod specifically here, uh, just as for the north part on the bay side of, of Barnstable County, uh, a lot of the coastal flooding will occur after the hurricane has passed us by. So you'd get an, a south wind or a, or a southeast wind that would drive the water out of Cape Cod Bay, and then once the storm passes, now you wind up with a west to a northwest wind, and the water kind of sloshes back, swirls around, and gets caught in both Wellfleet Harbor and uh, Provincetown Harbor. And that is a, a, another sneaky hazard for us, just due to the shape of our coastline, in that it, it, it tends to happen after the storm has passed us by, and uh, not necessarily before. So looking a, a little bit farther north of Boston, we're going to see uh, the surges, again, because of the, the shape of the, the coastline, it's a little bit less but we're, we're talking more beach erosion, and we, we, most of the folks up in the area know uh, that Plum Island is uh, obviously a concern for beach erosion, uh, but you'd also see the Merrimack River there again, even back into like Lawrence, uh, you're, you're looking at potential for a 15, 16 foot surge backing up just, uh, just up the Merrimack River itself. But in general, along the eastern Massachusetts coastline, there's potential from a Cat 3, if, if it were to hit us just right, for about uh, 5 to 8 feet of inundation. And that is, uh, is definitely a concern, and, and that's really the main reason we evacuate is, is the water. So we mentioned the uh, rapid average forward motion at landfall. You know, just historically, the great New England hurricane in 1938 made it from Cape Hatteras to Providence, Rhode Island in eight hours. So for those who uh, haven't looked at a map and done the math, it's about 434 miles uh, when, I, uh, when I calculated it out. And it's the interaction of a jet stream that we would typically have, even in the summer months, that would accelerate these storms up the coast uh, to get them into our area. So the good news is, because they're moving so fast, we, we usually wind up with a sh relatively short duration of sustained tropical storm and hurricane force winds. Tropical storm force winds are typically about 12 hours and hurricane force about three to six. Uh, if we do not get this rapid acceleration, then as we saw with Irene, uh, Irene was a hurricane, but it wasn't moving so fast and it weakened to a tropical storm before it made landfall in Connecticut and then moved up the Connecticut River Valley into Vermont. Uh, so while we didn't get the full impact of a landfalling hurricane, uh, we did get tremendous flooding, and so just because these things weaken from a hurricane to a tropical storm doesn't mean, hey, we're all good. Uh, you're still going to have some kind of significant impact from one. Uh, so the acceleration adds to the gust potential on the east side of the storm, and this would be the only caveat I would say of, you know, which side of the track are you on. If you're to the right of the track, you want to really have wind in mind if you're to the left. You want to be, uh, you want to think about heavy rainfall. So just as an example here at the Blue Hill Observatory, 629 feet during 1938, they had a sustained 121 mile per hour wind, with a peak gust to 186 miles per hour. So uh, that is you know, again, we we tend to focus on where the eye is and where the storm is, but the radius of uh, the maximum wind is often displaced. This was from Bob in 1991. You see Bob kind of the eye pretty much over Narragansett Bay, but the core of the strongest winds is, is moving over the Cape and the islands. So again, we, we want to be aware of where the storm is, but the impacts or the things that's going to cause the impact aren't necessarily where the eye is. So this is uh, just an image from Fort Worth, Texas, and this is just to bring the point of wind and uh, uh, tall buildings. So they had an F2 tornado that went through downtown Fort Worth, Texas, and did this damage to this building in about five minutes. So if you have a tall building in a Category 3 for a half an hour, what do you think the, the damage might be? Uh, so tall buildings are, are definitely going to be a, a concern, uh, in, especially in the urban areas. Tornadoes are also a threat in addition to high winds. 
These are typically in the northeast quadrant. Uh, that's where 90% of them form. So we'll, uh, we'll take a look at a couple examples here. This is also sneaky in that this can, this can happen, you know, hundreds if not thousands of miles in advance of the tropical storm. So if you look at the map of uh, Tropical Storm Cindy, you see the eye down there uh, close to Lake Pontchartrain in New Orleans, but you look upstream into Mississippi, Mississippi and uh, Alabama and Georgia, that's where all the tornadoes are. And then when it moved into the Tennessee Valley, you're getting tornadoes that are being spawned by this as far uh, northeast as Washington, D.C. And then you look at Dennis on the right, uh, never made landfall in Florida, but still had an impact with a uh, tornado outbreak over central Florida. So rainfall is probably one of the big ones that we want to talk about. Um, you don't necessarily want to do an evacuation in heavy rain if you can possibly manage it, and the heavy rain can arrive 12 to 15 hours in advance of the eye. Here in southern New England, the heaviest rainfall is almost always to the left of the track. And again, it's that jet stream interaction uh, that, that does this for us. So we'll go back to uh, Bob, which was our last landfalling hurricane in southern New England. Uh, the average rainfall west of the track is 6 to 10 inches. So here we see Bob off of the Outer Banks. And you see it's still fairly circular, but you can see the rain has already started to advance out ahead of Bob is almost into Atlantic City. And then when Bob was going uh, through southern New England, it was sunny on the Cape and you had a hurricane. All the rain uh, was to the left of Bob and it had lost its, uh, it had lost its symmetry. So when we look at the, uh, the rainfall for Bob, Again, it kind of went across southeast Massachusetts. The strongest winds were over the Cape and the islands, but all the heavy rainfall was back into central Massachusetts and generally uh, 6 to 10 inches. As I said, if it downgrades to a tropical storm, we remember Irene, but I also wanted to point out uh, Diane from 1955. This is still the uh, state 24-hour rainfall record in uh, Westfield, Massachusetts of uh, 18.15 inches. And their storm total, which fell in about 26 hours, was almost 20 inches of rain. So again, just because it's no longer a hurricane does not mean, even well inland, that there is not a, a life-threatening uh, impact from heavy rainfall. And uh, just to bring up our most recent visitor of Irene, uh, we had a, a storm that went across Long Island and up the Connecticut River Valley, and you see there, uh, especially towards the Berkshires, where you had a topographical influence, we had a, a significant amount of rain, 6 to 10 inches, and uh, farther east, not, uh, not nearly as much rain. Thank you, Bob and Matt. I appreciate that. Uh, great presentation to set us up for the remainder of the agenda in terms of the severity and importance of, of hurricane understanding and appreciation. Uh, just a quick reminder for folks, uh, for the folks that are utilizing laptops, um, it is encouraged for you to hide your menu bars and reduce the size of the display. Um, this will help you visually appreciate and see the presentations a little bit better. Um, but from what I understand, this is not an issue for those users utilizing PCs. Um, so go ahead and look to zoom out to see those slides a little bit better for those that are on laptops. Uh, up next, we have uh, our uh, updates from the National Hurricane Center products, services, and warnings. Uh, for those of you that have been following, especially the Pacific, uh, a lot of activity uh, in and in that area in the National Hurricane Center naturally has been overwhelmed. Um, so they were unable to join us today, um, and I'm sure you saw that on the agenda, um, but equally as capable and knowledgeable on the National Hurricane Center products uh, is Paul Morey, the Hurricane Program Manager for FEMA Region 1, and uh, Paul will walk us through the NHC's products and services for 2017. Paul? Okay, good morning. All right, now my mic's on. Thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, I'm not uh, Daniel Brown from the National Hurricane Center. He's, he's wicked smart, but I'll try my best to uh, cover for him um, in his absence. He's busy right now with all the tropical activity going on in the East Pacific. 
and a little something that they're watching off the uh, west coast of Africa, which uh, hopefully will not turn into anything, but good to take note of that. Um, what I'm going to start off doing is talking about the new storm surge um, watch and warning. And that's something new for, uh, it's operational in 2017. Prior to that, it was experimental. Um, as far as availability, it, you can get it graphically on the National Hurricane, National Hurricane Center website. And you'll also find it in text version in the watch warning section of the Hurricane Center Public Advisory, and also in uh, Totten's Weather Forecast Office Hurricane Local Statements, and will also be broadcast over um, EAS. Um, just to make sure everybody understands the, the meaning of the storm surge watch and warning, the storm surge watch means that there's a possibility of life-threatening inundation from rising water moving inland from the shoreline somewhere within the specified area generally within 48 hours. So that's basically the same time frame criteria as a hurricane watch. And then the storm surge warning, uh, there's a danger of life-threatening inundation from rising water moving inland from the shoreline somewhere within the specified area generally within 36 hours. So the key there is that the watch as a possibility and the warning is a danger of life-threatening inundation. Um, we'll talk about some of the key differences between the um, new storm surge watch warning and the potential storm surge flooding map. Potential storm surge flooding map is also a new product from the Hurricane Center. So uh, first off, the storm surge watch and warning is intended for the general public while the potential storm surge flooding map is made for decision makers. And what that shows is a reasonable worst case scenario. It's not the official forecast from the NHC's advisory. So it's not what is expected, but it's what is possible. Uh, so basically a one in 10 chance that those levels could be exceeded. Um, the storm surge watch and warning is subjective. So it's actually hand drawn um, with coordination between the National Hurricane Center and the weather, local weather forecast offices. While the potential storm surge flooding map is objective, so it's just straight the results from that slosh model that Matt talked about earlier. Um, the storm surge watch and warning is categorical, so it has to meet the criteria of being a life-threatening um, inundation. While the potential storm surge flooding map is quantitative, so it really gives you bins of inundation levels. So there are you know, one to three feet of inundation expected, um, three to six, six to nine, and so forth. Um, and that's just to uh, reinforce that the potential storm surge flooding map is not the official advisory, that it is just the potential worst case scenario. And we've got a little something uh, funky going on with our slides. There we go. Um, the next thing that's new for this year is a potential tropical cyclone. Um, that's basically intended to be used when there's the possibility or a threat of tropical storm or hurricane conditions to land within 48 hours. The Hurricane Center is the option to issue advisories, watches, and warnings. Um, typically, the reason they would do that, most of the time it's going to be in areas like the Gulf of Mexico where you could have a disturbance um, turn into um, a tropical storm or hurricane uh, very quickly and close to land. In the past, if that happened, you would basically would not have the Hurricane Center suite of products to be able to make decisions on. Um, and now they'll be able to issue this early so that the general um, public can take action and also emergency managers can take action. Um, just for the criteria, the watch warning criteria on the potential tropical cyclone is going to be the same standard as an actual um, advisory for uh, watch warning for a tropical storm or hurricane. Um, so no difference there. And then the, the way that they would name it, um, they would be identified as potential tropical cyclones, and they'd use the same numbering system as when they have a depression. So it would be potential tropical cyclone one, two, and so forth, and so on. Um, and there's actually been two this year. So they got early practice in June, which is um, pretty early in the year for tropical activity. But um, I do believe that they were able to use those um, with some success. Um, the standard NHC advisory products will be available when they issue these potential storm surge flooding maps. So that would be the text advisory, the forecast advisory, the discussion, wind speed probabilities, cone graphic, um, storm surge products. Uh, one thing to take note of, 
is that the genesis probabilities that you see on the graphical tropical weather outlook, those won't be shown um, on the same graphic as the potential tropical cyclone, just so to avoid any confusion. Um, issuance considerations, I really already talked about that. Just if there's going to be likely impacts, we need to get that information out quickly so people can make decisions. This is something that's less likely to be used in our area, but it is possible. We had um, author and Bill, I believe, that formed shortly after those systems went over the Carolinas and out to sea. So it is possible, so I just wanted to make sure that folks are familiar with that. As far as mess messaging considerations, it'll be issued for only systems threatening land within that time frame, so 48 hours or, six, or 36 hours. Uh, the advisory packages will be discontinued when the watches and warnings are no longer necessary. Some updates to the NHC suite of graphical products. Um, the main thing is on the map that you guys are used to seeing when you're looking at a, an active storm, they've really just cleaned it up. I'd say bring it more into the, the look and feel of um, maps that you'd see online, say Google or other types of maps. The other key important factor to notice though is that it includes the initial wind field, so that area and sort of a brownish orange there. So the reason that they're doing that is to reinforce the fact that you can experience hazards outside of that white cone of uncertainty. The cone of uncertainty only tells you where the center of the storm would be, could be two-thirds of the time. Um, and so you don't want to think about these systems as a point on the map, but rather uh, the whole range of hazards that you could have um, within the cone and, and outside of the cone. So this kind of reinforces that fact. And just as an, as an example, Hurricane Sandy, um, the effects of that storm were felt so, it, the storm I believe was a thousand miles in radius. Um, so while there was flooding in New York and New Jersey, it was also snowing three feet in West Virginia. And uh, they did get a declaration out of that. And it was interesting being at the National Hurricane Center and watching uh, the former director um, briefing uh, President Obama on snowfall, uh, not something that I've ever seen before. Uh, the next product that I'll talk about is the experimental, um, experimental this year time of arrival graphic. Um, basically what this shows you is the earliest, there's two, there's two pieces to this. One product is the earliest reasonable arrival time of winds. And you may use that if you are more risk averse and you want to make sure that all of your protective actions, evacuations, um, anything you're going to do on the response side, you've put in a, you've put in a good safety buffer. And then there's the second um, option is the most likely arrival time. Um, so if you're, if you're uh, okay with using you know, what's, what's likely to happen, you can use that. So it's really up to the user as far as the, what they want to do. Um, you may have seen similar products that uh, WFO Totten puts out. Um, for their winter graphics, um, not for the public, but for emergency managers only, where they display the, uh, the most likely snowfall amounts and then worst case snowfall amounts, um, which also has a, a similar uh, flavor idea behind it. Um, just an example, the hurricane, this would be an example from Hurricane Andrew back in 1992 if they had this product. Um, the earliest reasonable arrival time would show you that Winds, uh, tropical storm force winds could arrive around midnight Sunday into very early Monday morning, while the most likely time would show you um, just before daybreak on Monday. Um, another thing that's new, I believe, yes, they, were, they started at last hurricane season. The Hurricane Center will issue these key messages. They'll put it out um, via social media. They'll put it out on their website. So. Um, Facebook, Twitter, any way that they possibly can. They'll also include it in their forecast discussions. And the key messages could be things like calling attention to an inland flooding threat, um, calling attention to uh, the possibility of surge, you know, far outside of the cone, things that they feel the public needs to know, or if there's a greater, um, a greater amount of uncertainty in the forecast, so that would be intended for the public. It would be intended for media, TV media, just to make sure that they're really hammering in on those main points that they want people to um, walk away with. Um, I would encourage you to, if you're on Twitter, to subscribe to the Hurricane Center Twitter accounts. 
They've got one for their storm surge unit. They've got one for their Atlantic operations, one for the director. And that's another place where you get key messages um, during, a, during an actual storm threat. And that kind of keeps you up to date or gives you an early heads up to say, like in this example, um, the possibility that NHC will initiate advisories for, in this example, subtropical storm Alex. So it just sort of gives you, keeps you in the loop, um, make sure you know what's going on just a little, a little ahead of time um, to give you that extra time to make any plans um, that you might have. That's it. Kind of move through them quickly. Um, again, not Daniel Brown, but feel free to email him. You can see his email address right there. I believe my contact information will be up uh, later in this presentation. You can also feel free to contact me at any time. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, and just as a reminder, one of the purposes and intents of this webinar, as the director had mentioned in the beginning, was to become familiar with uh, and appreciate these products, tools, and services now um, with a lot of great tools and, and services being provided by the National Hurricane Center. Now is the time to, to understand and become familiar with the products, understand how you would leverage them to help make decisions uh, for your organization, uh, and really um, understand the importance of these products. Uh, just a quick note on, on questions. If you do have a question, please go ahead uh, and post your question via the chat feature as discussed in the beginning on the lower right hand part of the screen. Uh, go ahead and post your question to David Bryant, the co-host. Uh, and David, again, will we'll share those questions with the speakers here. Up next, uh, we'll bring Matt Belk back to the table uh, to discuss National Weather Service tropical cyclone products and services from the Taunton office. Matt? Thank you, Mike. Um, as the uh, slide says, uh, Glenn Shield uh, graciously put these slides uh, together for me. Uh, it was a, a tremendous help. We were preparing for the uh, webinar. So we're going to uh, talk about, uh, Paul talked about the National Hurricane Center products. And then in addition to those, or, or to supplement those, the local weather forecast office that I work at and uh, work for Bob at, uh, we will try to downscale the impacts from the kind of the bigger national picture down to a more local southern New England, Massachusetts uh, kind of flavor. And the first product we're going to talk about is the hurricane local statement. Uh, basically going to be your executive summary. It's going to come out uh, shortly after the Hurricane Center advisory, where we're going to give a, an overview of the storm from our local perspective, and uh, along with some potential impacts that we would expect or uh, could be a, a threat to southern New England. It uh, serves as a common source of information for the public, media, uh, decision makers, uh, but you as emergency managers who are looking to seek more specific information, uh, this is not the product for you. Uh, you should actually uh, call us or uh, look at the uh, next product that we're going to talk about, uh, which will be the uh, tropical cyclone warning, uh, the local version. But this is an example of a hurricane local statement. Uh, this would have been from Ermine. Uh, back in uh, 2016, so you're going to have a, a new information section. So if you're really limited on time, you could just check out the new information, and if nothing's changed, it'll say something very simply like, nothing's changed. Uh, it's just a quick, this is what's changed since the last statement. Uh, we'll have a, a repeat of the storm information from the, uh, the Hurricane Center position, and then we'll try to relate it uh, to something a little uh, a little bit closer to us. So in this example here, Ermine was about 280 miles south of Nantucket. The situation overview will be written uh, by myself or my colleagues, and that is just a, a summary of the storm, the threats, the impacts that could uh, impact southern New England. And uh, we will uh, we'll try to, to keep that as brief as we can and, and still convey the information that needs to be conveyed. Well, one of the other more important aspects of the HLS is, uh, is going to be at the very, very bottom of the product. There will be a time that you could expect uh, another update from us uh, for this product. So if you have a decision to make and you're wondering when am I going to get an update on information, uh, there will be that time at the very at the very bottom of the uh, of the statement 
uh, that would let you know when you can expect this to be updated. Uh, we'll also have some you know, potential impacts for wind, surge, flooding, rain, tornadoes, just very general, uh, maybe some other websites. So then we get into the actual tro local tropical cyclone warning. This product is really long because it's really detailed. It's not meant to be read. Uh, you know, you just print it off and you read it. It's, uh, it's kind of tough to work with. It's meant to work with a website, which unfortunately is not working this season. Hopefully it will be up uh, for next season where you would just go to a map and then click on a, uh, click on a map uh, and then get the information specific to that region right there. So this is an example from North Carolina. Uh, so just very quickly, you'll have the event coding that the media partners will use for activation of EAS. We'll have a summary of headlines. Uh, then you'll, you'll see the area that is impacted. In this case, we're, we're talking about Ocracoke Island. And then you will, you will always have this information in this order. We will talk about the wind. We will talk about the surge. We'll talk about flooding rain. And we will talk about tornadoes. If you are inland and storm surge is definitely not a threat, the storm surge section will be omitted. But uh, what you will get, and we'll take a look at the wind section, which is on the, the lower left there, you're going to get the latest forecast. This isn't what could happen. This is what we actually think will happen. And then when you move down to the next section, you have the current threat. This is where the what could happen comes into play, as well as the potential impact. That's when the what could happen comes into play. And then it'll be the same thing for the storm surge, the flooding rain, uh, and the tornado. Uh, for those who have been in the business uh, long enough to uh, remember Irene, and uh, even some of the earlier storms, we do generate these hurricane threats and impact graphics for, again, the main hazards that we're worried about, wind, storm surge, flooding rain, and tornado. Uh, the short version of these slides are this is the types of impacts you should be preparing for. This is not necessarily what will actually happen, but this is, this is the threat. So if you're in an extreme for southern New England, uh, that would mean that you would be a, a category three or higher. A high impact would be a, a category one or two hurricane. Moderate would be a, a strong tropical storm, and elevated would be a, a, would be a weaker tropical storm. Uh, we cover most of Massachusetts except Berkshire County. If you are in Berkshire County, our uh, sister office in the Albany, New York area will also provide this graphic and you will actually be able to mosaic it at a, uh, at a larger scale. So we see an example here from Matthew when it was down uh, south of uh, Cuba and near Haiti, just about ready to head up through the Bahamas, and you see the example from Florida there based on that forecast, that was the threat uh, for, for the east coast of Florida. We produce these to assist our media partners and, and state partners in communicating the message of the threat. This can help with anything from evacuation. Uh, it's, a, it's a very friendly graphic uh, for working with media partners to help get the word out of, of what, uh, what types of threats and uh, preparedness actions we might need to take. As I mentioned before, the uh, specifically designed website for getting this information is not yet available. There is another website for those who use our digital weather information at digital.weather.gov. If you click on the drop down menu where it says maximum temperature, uh, you can scroll down almost towards the bottom where it says tropical, and then you will be able to not only get the, uh, the wind speed probabilities, uh, that are operational this year, but then you see the hurricane wind threat, the surge threat, the flooding rain threat, and that will be mosaic on whatever scale you need. So that is a national website. So for the local products, if you go to our website, uh, for those of you who aren't already aware, we produce a, a hazardous weather outlook, and that is going to be 
uh, are your early sign of trouble. The hurricane forecasts only go out five days. We will go out seven. So that will be your, your first uh, stop. Uh, it, you can also find it right up there at the top. It's the uh, first menu item above the map. The area of forecast discussion, we'll also be talking about things. When we start getting into actual tropical events, you see the, the tropical button there in the lower left, and then the uh, watches and warnings and river products uh, for those worried about inland flooding from, from heavy rainfall. So we'll take a closer look at the tropical button, what that is. You see the, uh, the main page on the left, and then what will come up is a, a bunch of tabs. And some of this will have uh, the, you know, the tropical weather discussion from the Hurricane Center. We've designed it to be a, a one-stop shopping uh, experience. Uh, you can get a lot of these products through a variety of ways. You can get it from the National Hurricane Center. You can get quite a few of them uh, directly in Hervac as well. Uh, this is yet another option for you to be able to, to get this information. So as we get into uh, notifications, that's actually uh, one of the questions of getting onto the NWS listserv for these notifications. Uh, as we know, the world has changed. We have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have text, we have the web. Uh, one of the ways that you can communicate what, with us is NWS chat. Uh, there is an emergency manager room. It is just us and emergency managers. Anybody who applies to get into this protected room uh, must supply whom they work for and in what capacity. Once you've been verified as a bona fide emergency manager, you will be granted access to that room so you can ask any question you like. Uh, no media is in this room, so if you want to ask you know, what's the worst case scenario, uh, we can discuss things without uh, getting into uh, having to worry about uh, information getting out before you're, uh, before you're ready to, to have it get out. So uh, you would actually contact uh, our office either via email at box.operations at noaa.gov or you can contact glenn.field at noaa.gov directly for access to the NWS chat and uh, we will begin the process from there. So here's just an example from uh, the June 1 tornado back in 2011. Uh, this is a different chat room, and we actually had received word of a visual confirmation of a tornado on the ground in Springfield from uh, Channel 22 that they had on their, their webcam, and they, they shared that message with us. So it is a chat service, uh, not unlike uh, the chat feature in WebEOC. And that is just a, another mechanism that you can use to uh, get in contact with us. Another way uh, that you can get the information is uh, from INWS. You get free alerts from us. Uh, you just basically define the area you're interested in and what hazards you wish to be notified for. If we issue that type of a warning for the area that you're interested in, you will get uh, a text message or an email message depending on what you choose, uh, depending on, on which options uh, you choose. So uh, just to more fully answer that question from Kristen of how you get on the listserv for uh, notifications, uh, we do provide, uh, for those who, who know, we provide the, the DSS briefings uh, typically in the afternoons. Uh, for like winter storms, uh, you would, we would basically put you onto a list. Unfortunately, there's only so many spots that we have. So we, uh, we do require uh, you, you be a, of a certain level of emergency manager. Unfortunately, this means that not all the local emergency managers can get on. Uh, we will brief MEMA, and uh, if MEMA decides to hold a conference call, uh, you would go there. If you would like access to the DSS emails that we send, again, you can contact uh, box.operations at noaa.gov or glenn.field at noaa.gov directly, and uh, we, will, we will make sure you get put into the appropriate, uh, the appropriate slot. During a tropical cyclone, however, uh, we do provide services to three states. Uh, we need to be a little bit more structured 
in our conference calls. We, we just mentioned this. This is our uh, scheduled conference calls with MEMA. So again, if you're trying to decide when am I going to make a decision, uh, this slide will, will tell you the approximate times that we're talking with Massachusetts, and then shortly thereafter you would be able to get the information uh, from Massachusetts and then uh, have that to make your, available to make your decision. So if there are any other questions, uh, we will be happy to answer. Otherwise, I will turn it back over to Mike. Thank you, Matt. And that was a, a great segue into the next part of our agenda. Uh, the next part of our agenda will, will basically include an, an overview of, of decision support uh, services. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, throughout this presentation, we've heard uh, to start the presentation, we heard about hurricanes, the threats, and the impacts to, to lay the foundation. From there, we went to the National Hurricane Center, learned about the tools, products, and services that the National Hurricane Center has to offer, and just recently moved to the Taunton office and how they utilize that information and disseminate key uh, messages uh, and offer additional tools and services. The next part of our agenda, as I would indicated, will now include uh, decision support making. So we'll start off by uh, a presentation by bringing back Paul Morey, uh, Planning for the Threat, Hurricane Evacuation Decision Making. Paul? Great. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> um, the focus uh, that, I'll, that I'll get into with this uh, is definitely going to be related to the new Massachusetts Hurricane Evacuation Study. Um, it's part of a, a larger study, the Southern New England uh, Hurricane Evacuation Study, and we'll kind of talk about the nuts and bolts of what that study is and, and how it's useful to you. Um, so the key decision making factors that um, every emergency manager faces, just some of those things, the, some of the questions that you have are going to be, will we be impacted by the storm? Uh, when would that happen? How long? What's the duration of the storm? Um, are we going to get coastal flooding? Um, where is it going to flood? How much is it going to flood? What about winds and inland flooding from rain? Uh, then the then, you know, very key decision, do we need to evacuate? Um, if we do need to evacuate, when do we need to start that? How long is it going to take? So the hurricane evacuation study, um, the National Hurricane Center and National Weather, local National Weather Service products are going to um, assist and support you with that um, to give you that information that you need to make an evacuation decision and uh, be successful with that. So there's five analysis that come with the hurricane evacuation study. I'll go through each one in a little bit more detail. Uh, the first is a hazards analysis, then a vulnerability analysis, behavioral analysis, shelter analysis, and finally the transportation analysis. Um, think of these as, as layers as we go through them. Each one sort of feeds into the next in order to arrive um, at these evacuation clearance times, which I'll cover. Um, the hurricane evacuation study would be used for response, but keep in mind that there's a lot of good planning data in here that you have 365 um, days out of the year that you can use to inform your, your hurricane plans um, as you develop those. Um, so the hazard analysis, first analysis of the hurricane evacuation study is understanding the storm surge potential. So we evacuate, we hide from the wind, we run from the water. Um, storm surge has the highest potential for death and damage. It's the main reason that we evacuate. And what we use on the HES, I'll just refer to it as the HES, is the worst case scenario surge maps that are used to assess risk in your community. Uh, Massachusetts does have new surge maps, sometimes referred to as splash maps. And I believe Director Schwartz will talk about those uh, later on in the webinar and, and point out where you can, where you can um, find those for your use. Um, Matthew mentioned the slosh model. Uh, that is what the National Hurricane Center uses to develop these maps. They are maximum of maximum storm surge potential, the MOMS. And what they do, this isn't a, um, a probabilistic map or a map like the flood insurance rate maps. This is basically um, thousands of hypothetical storms. So they look at different intensities, pressures, angles of approach, forward speeds, um, the size of the storm. So they try to really cover all the different possibilities that are um, reasonably sound for the area that we live in. And what you get is a one per category, a map with one uh, flood range per category, worst case scenario. Keep in mind that 
these are not forecasts. Okay, these are available um, again 365 days out of the year, and typically you'd use them operationally. I'd use them to um, assess your risk at longer time frames. So when a storm is you know five to seven days away, you're not going to be getting any forecast information. There's just too much uncertainty. So that's when you would use those maps. Uh, those maps are also the basis for creating evacuation zones. Um, again, new evacuation zones for Massachusetts and actually all of southern New England. Uh, basically, you can see in this graphic that on the left side is your extensive storm surge, and then on the right side are the evacuation zones that were created um, using those maps. Um, there's basically a couple of uh, intended uses for these maps um, or having the evacuation zone approach. Um, first, to communicate risk to the public. So folks know if they live in a you know, zone A, so category one and two storm threat, or zone B, category three and four storm threat, um, as we have here in New England. They also help to conduct an orderly evacuation by being able to just call out zones, um, using the practice of saying, you know, evacuate low-lying areas or areas that flood frequently really isn't adequate. Um, there's maybe new residents that don't have any experience with prior flooding. Um, flood extents could go way beyond, and, and they will eventually go way beyond what people are used to. Um, so it, it, it's not really the best approach. So using the evacuation zones um, to conduct those evac to conduct the evacuations and, and call those evacuations orders or recommendations uh, much better using using what's found um, on the MEMA website and in the hurricane evacuation study. Um, so now that we know what areas are at risk, we need to know what's vulnerable within them. So the vulnerability analysis talks about um, the population at risk and also critical facilities that are at risk, mobile manufactured homes, um, shelters, colleges, universities, you know, police stations, fire departments. And in the HDS, those come in a, a tabular format as well as graphical. So again, good planning data that you can use year-round. You, know, you can pull out the vulnerability analysis and be able to plan for um, any changes that you might need to make. So for example, you look in there and you find out that um, two of your fire stations are actually in zone A. So you can plan for what you're going to do about that in terms of timing um, and any special considerations that you might need to make. Uh, the next analysis is the uh, behavioral analysis or behavioral survey that we conducted. Um, the intent of the survey, there we go. Um, is to ascertain attitudes about risk from hurricane hazards. So primarily looking at storm surge, since again, that's the, the hazard that creates um, really the most havoc on areas, causes the most uh, deaths. Uh, we ask about evacuation intentions, past experiences. So for example, did you evacuate from Sandy? Um, why did you evacuate? Where did you go? Or would you evacuate for a particular storm scenario? Why or why not? Et cetera, et cetera. We ask about evacuation routes. So, if if you left or if you uh, if you would leave, would you use Route 44? Would you use 95? Would you use 3? We ask about sources of forecast information. Um, are you getting it from the web? Are you getting it from local TV media? Um, the information that comes from this analysis, primarily the evacuation intentions and destinations and routes, those feed into the transportation analysis. Um, those assumptions are used by the transportation engineer, which I'll, I'll talk about uh, towards the end of this presentation. Um, the next piece that we have is a shelter analysis. Uh, all of this comes under the National Hurricane Program. We don't, we're not the, the shelter specialists. It's not our main mission. Um, but we do include this analysis in the HES because we want to point out or give you information to ascertain your flood risk. So again, just an inventory of your shelters, what their capacities are, what the potential demand is by scenario, and then whether or not they are in an evacuation zone. So again, to be able to know whether or not that's something that you're going to be able to use. Um, you may have shelters that are in a category B uh, evacuation zone, but you're only going to evacuate A, so you can plan accordingly. Now, there's some additional information like the capacity of the shelters, if they're Red Cross versus local shelters. Um, and if they're pet friendly, which is a, a major concern, there are many people who will not evacuate if they don't have a place to put their pet. So that's something that needs to be addressed. Um, finally is the transportation analysis. So we take all that information and transportation engineer takes that and basically looks at the traffic patterns and specifically the bottlenecks uh, as that's what drives the speed of the traffic. 
look at numbers of evacuating vehicles as well and population. What comes from that are what we call clearance times. Those come in a tabular format as well, and they're variables of response. So do people, if there's an evacuation recommendation or order, do people, you know, pack up and jump right in the car? Do they say, well, you know, we'll wait. We're not sure this is really going to happen. We'll wait another day or two before we decide if we're going to leave. Um, you look at population. So is it Cape Cod during tourist season or is it after Labor Day? Obviously, that's going to affect how many people are on the road trying to leave. Look at evacuation scenarios. Um, Multi-state, our study does take into account traffic for, um, you know, for people evacuating or moving around from Rhode Island, from New Hampshire, we, you know, even out to Connecticut, Maine, New Hampshire, all, all of the, the entire area, and also neighboring towns as well. So it's not really done in a vacuum. And then it's also done by storm category. Um, this is just an example of what a clearance time is and sort of how it works um, operationally. So I point out the last webinar, you see 48 hours there. I should just change that, but that's an example. Okay, we do not here have a 48-hour clearance time. I believe the worst case scenario that we have maybe oh, 32, 33 hours, somewhere in that time frame. Um, but just for the example, just for the sake of the example, um, the clearance time begins when the first evacuating vehicle gets on the roadway, and it ends when the last vehicle reaches an assumed point of safety. So, it's not. It's going to, you know, a single person is going to be in a car for 48 hours or whatever that, that time might be. It's really conducting the entire evacuation. Um, if you look out at H minus 48, that would be the start of the evacuation. 48 hours later, it needs to be completed. And the, the criteria for completing the evacuation is the forecast onset of tropical storm force winds or surge. Um, most of the time, it's going to be triggered by the wind because you don't want you know, you don't want people driving around or doing anything or first responders out when you've got tropical storm conditions already happening. Uh, Matt mentioned that you could have rainfall far out ahead and earlier than the storm, so that's, you know, another concern to really look at your timing in terms of when you want to start and finish that evacuation. I did put surge because there have been examples, there have been storms in the past where surge has actually preceded the onset of the winds. Um, the clearance times do take into account background traffic, um, shadow evacuees, which are people that leave even if they don't need to. Um, there's a lot of safety buffer built in. The idea is not to slice the bologna too thin, so it's, it's very, very conservative, and those clearance times allow the entire at-risk population um, the opportunity to evacuate. We know that most smaller numbers than we would like evacuate, but you still time-wise need to plan for um, evacuating of a larger population within each zone. Um, so the way the evacuation decision calculation happens is the Hurricane Center is going to put out the forecast advisories, which we discussed earlier. Those are going to give you the arrival time of the tropical storm force winds. And with your HES, you've delineated your hurricane evacuation zones. You have the clearance times in there. Um, so basically, you're going to subtract that. So if the arrival time of the winds is noon and you have a six-hour clearance time, at 6 a.m., you'd need to start that ev evacuation. Um, recognizing that there's a lot more that goes into it than just the evacuation itself, it's important to think about the, the timelines and sort of backing out from that evacuation clearance times as you're going to have to think about things like when you make a recommendation and um, getting state troopers out on the road to man traffic control points, things like that. A lot of those, for those that are familiar, are in the Cape Cod Emergency Traffic Plan is a great example of sort of the, the entire time frame of operations and then how that plays into clearance times as well. Um, if you do not want to get on your, your DVD or um, read through a paper copy of the HES and you, um, outside of taking that data that I talked about for planning purposes, more operationally, you can get the clearance times in HERVAC. Um, probably most people, I hope, are familiar with HERVAC. Um, what it allows you to do is basically get situational awareness of the storm, um, current conditions, and the forecast. It, the software will pull in all the information from the National Hurricane Center and update it automatically. It all, using that, it takes your clearance times, and you can do calculations about 
the evacuation start time based on the advisory at that time. So there's a lot of different um, analytics that you can do for um, decision making, evacuation decision making. Um, if you're not already registered for the program, it's free for emergency managers. Just make sure that you use your, um, your official work email. You can go to hervac.com. Um, it takes about two minutes to register, and you'll get a link, and you can go ahead and download that. Um, an update, updated version should be coming out, I believe, within a week or so, um, and I highly recommend um, getting that. Um, just really briefly, there will be an updated version of HERAVAC, or I guess the next generation that at least right now we're calling HVX. It's been in development um, within the National Hurricane Program, um, developed by MIT's Lincoln Laboratories. Um, all of the, the input and recommendations and sort of the crafting of this program um, come from a work group of emer local, state, and federal emergency managers, hurricane experts, um, basically from Texas to Maine. Um, you're not going to lose any of the functionality of HERAVAC. It's going to have all of the, the features and functionality and some of the look that people are used to. Um, HERAVAC has been around since about 1985, so wanted to do no harm with making changes. Uh, but there will be some additional features, um, basically a, a more user-friendly sort of map and interface, a little more, again, like Google Maps. Um, you'll be able to do some storm surge analysis in there that you, right now you'd have to go to a different program to do. So now you can do it sort of all in one spot. It has uh, your evacuation zones in there, which you could overlay with the storm surge forecast. Again, it's pulling everything in from the National Hurricane Center. Uh, there's several things. Uh, one significant, very significant point that I would like to make is that the National Hurricane Program really cannot, we don't have the resources, um, money, and staff, and time-wise to provide as much training as we would like to. Um, with HERVAC training, typically there's one, maybe two, usually one training per state per year. Um, it's somewhat perishable because you may not use it. You know, you're waiting till the next hurricane season. If there's no storms that you're that you're using it with, you may start to forget some things. So what we've done in HVX to to meet that issue, um, HVX has a self-training component. Basically, you can first of all get a tutorial on how to use it. Then you can go through evacuation scenarios. Um, where would you find this product to inform this decision? You hunt around, try to find the, the proper button to do that. If you can't find it, it gives you a, a gentle hint and pushes you to the right button. You can look at analytics for that. So you could run it in your EOC um, with anonymous answers. You could do it yourself and you could say, okay, out of these, t you know, these 10 questions, um, number five. A lot of people are having trouble with number five and that's this particular product. So let's try to focus on that as we trade for this hurricane season. Um, two more slides, uh, just a summary slide. So again, that hurricane evacuation study, it informs your plans. You've got all that data from the five analysis. Um, with the transportation analysis, besides the clearance times, there's some very detailed information and maps about those choke traffic um, choke points and suggested traffic control points, things like that. Um, it supports your response operations through having those clearance times, through being able to know which critical facil facilities and populations that you may want to evacuate, look at shelter risk capacity and demand. You've got the guidance on HERAVAC, clearance time by storm scenario, um, and again, what I mentioned about traffic bottlenecks and traffic control points. I lied, there's two more slides. Um, as soon as the switch is here, I just want to make a point about the timing of decision making and the products that come out of the National Hurricane Center and also, also the local um, National Weather Service office. So along the timeline for response, you're going to need to answer, you know, the critical questions that I started sort of at the beginning of this presentation. The, there's a, a myriad of products that come from the Hurricane Center and the Weather Service, and they all sort of come out at different times. Further out from the storm, you get, you get less products because um, there's just, there's too much uncertainty in the forecast to start drilling down to a more accurate level, a precise level to hang your hat on. So you still need to start making some decisions. So you're going to look at those surge maps that I talked about. Um, you'll look at the graphical tropical weather outlook, for example. And as you move closer in time to the storm threat, you'll start seeing storm surge watches. And you may see storm surge watches and warnings. 
tropical storm, hurricane watches and warnings, things like that. So as you're doing your plan, as you're you know, looking at key actions you need to take or considerations, try and factor in all these different products and what questions they can answer and when they can answer them. All right, now is my last slide. Um, this is just sort of a point that I try to make as much as possible. It can be a little bit confusing because I did say that the evacuation clearance times are, they go by category, by storm category. When you're looking at the, the actual forecast, surge forecast that you're going to be getting from the Hurricane Center and then a more refined view from the Weather Service, um, about 48 hours out from the onset of the hazard, um, there's going to be differences in just looking at straight Saffir Simpson category. So oftentimes up here, people will say, you know, well, like say Irene, for example, well, it was just a tropical storm. If you lived in Vermont, it wasn't just a tropical storm. It was the worst flooding that you had since 1927. Um, and some examples right here, kind of more um, focused on storm surge. Hurricane Charlie off the coast of Florida, I believe, came in as a Category 4, yet the surge was about 7 feet or so maximum. And that's because Hurricane Charlie was a very small, very compact storm. And that, combined with the angle of approach and some other factors, made it so that the surge wouldn't be uh, as extreme as you would think when you hear Category 4. Um, Sandy. Sandy was extra tropical, hybrid winter storm, what, whatever you want to call it, the media calls it, it, it doesn't really matter. The characteristics of Sandy, it was a, a very, very a massive storm with a huge wind field, and it was moving sort of west, northwest, and at that angle and at that size, it caused, you know, extensive flooding, 12, 13, 14 feet in some areas. So you don't want to let your guard down just because it's, you know, extra tropical, or it's, now it's turned into sort of a winter storm. It, it really doesn't matter. Uh, two more examples. Um, Ike in Texas, well, that was quote unquote only category two. The surge started 24 hours before the winds came in, and it was catastrophic flooding uh, in excess of 20 feet. In Katrina, category three, up to 29, 30 feet of storm surge. So think, think of the individual characteristics of the storm and the potential impacts. Um, and you did see some products uh, that were briefed earlier today um, and some very um, more refined, more local specific products um, that come out of the, the Taunton office of the National Weather Service to sort of help you um, start to think about and hone your decision making. Um, I did promise that was my last slide. Um, here's my contact information. Uh, please feel free to call me or email me at any time. I'd be Happy to, uh, to help you out or answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. And for our, uh, and before I get to our final presentation, just as a reminder, for questions, uh, should you have any questions, uh, please go ahead and go into the chat feature uh, in the bottom right-hand part of your browser and private message David Bryant, our co-host. Uh, so again, and under the notes box in the lower right part of your browser, uh, please go ahead and uh, private message David Bryant, and we'll continue to take those questions via the chat feature. And our final presentation this morning for this webinar uh, will be the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency Preparedness Updates. Uh, and to start our presentation, I'll now introduce Director Kurt Schwartz, who will start us off with an overview of our inundation maps. Director? Uh, thank you, Mike. And Mike and I are going to tag team on some of the preparedness information we're going to provide. But I want to start first uh, build on uh, some of the things you heard from Paul Morey and uh, first talk about hurricane inundation maps um, and want to make sure you know how you can access those maps. All communities were provided copies of these maps when they were uh, prepared, but uh, they're also available through our website. So if you go to our website, mass.gov backslash MEMA, You'll see on the left a uh, link for emergencies and disasters. If you click on that link, it will take you to a next page. I'm just waiting for the slides to update here. And you'll get to the next page, and you see a link called Hurricanes. If you click on Hurricanes, um, it takes you to the next page. 
Um, and at the bottom of the page, you'll see hurricane inundation maps. Um, and then you come to um, um, a, a set of interactive uh, maps. And um, this is sort of the web, the, the view you're going to be looking at. Um, but again, you can zoom in and out uh, on your area of interest or your community. want to make a couple notes. Um, these maps are color coded uh, into four levels of inundation. Um, you'll see the legend at the top uh, that indicates that the levels of in inundation are roughly tied to category of storm. Uh, but building on what Paul just talked about, we're going to have some discussions here about potentially removing the categories and changing that, those four levels to minimal, moderate, extreme, uh, extensive, and then extreme. Um, because it may well be that we have a tropical storm approaching. Um, we could have a tropical storm that has um, extensive uh, or extreme inundation. So these maps are planning tools are available to you 24-7. These provide really the reasonable worst case scenarios for your community. And as I said, um, you can uh, zoom in on an area and uh, really do uh, proactive pre-planning, understand your community's risk for inundation from you know, minimal inundation all the way up to extreme inundation. And again, these are planning maps. Um, the planning maps, um, you can also download um, PDFs by community. You'll see the link uh, at the bottom uh, for hurricane inundation maps by community. And this uh, takes you to uh, an area on the website um, where you can choose your community and you'll get a zoomable um, PDF, you can zoom in and out and again see the wor reasonable worst case scenarios uh, for your community. Now hurricane inundation maps um, are what we used to create evacuation zone maps for all of our coastal communities. Um, so to get to the hurricane evacuation zone maps, you go back to our main page of our website, and you'll see sort of on the bottom of the main page a link called Map Resources. If you click on Map Resources, uh, you come uh, to um, a page that gives you uh, options for different maps that are available to you. Over on the right, you'll see Evacuation Zones. And if you click on Evacuation Zones, uh, you're going to come uh, to a different part of our website where we have interactive maps. And again, uh, these maps allow you to zoom in and out on any area of the Commonwealth. Um, and here what we're seeing is sort of an overview, a broad view of the Cape. Um, and I'll, I'll stop here. So for most of the Commonwealth, for most of our coastal communities, we have two evacuation zones. A, evacuation zone A, which is that maroonish, brownish color, and evacuation zone B, which is yellow. Zone A is meant, it shows the areas that are susceptible, that if we're looking at minimal to moderate inundation, those are the areas we would expect to be inundated. Yellow uh, would be, uh, those areas that would be reached with extensive or extreme inundation. Um, and you can zoom in uh, a step further. Uh, and I'll show you an example uh, here. You can, uh, you know, looking at Wareham, um, you can zoom in and get a real good sense of the areas of your community um, that are within the zones. Um, now, Two points. It is critical that you know, as Paul said, your clearance times 
for your evacuation zones. If I'm just using Wareham as an example, if uh, if we have an approaching storm and we are and the forecast is for uh, minimal to moderate inundation, coastal flooding in Wareham, then we are looking at potentially an evacuation of area A. It is critical that you know the clearance time for uh, for area A in your community because that is going to help you know when you need to make that evacuation decision. Um, the other point I want to make is now that the hurricane center uh, starting 48 hours in, uh, prior to landfall will be issuing uh, storm surge maps. Um, what we will do here at MEMA is as soon as storm surge maps are issued by the Hurricane Center, we will consume them into our GIS products um, and we will overlay the storm surge maps on top of the evacuation zone maps uh, so that we and you as public safety professionals will be able to look at the forecast for surge and see how it overlays on our evacuation zones so that you can make even a smarter decision about whether to evacuate and which zones. Um, and we've already set that up um, and uh, that, will, that overlay will automatically be available um, as soon as the Hurricane Center issues a pro uh, storm surge product. Um, and one note for um, the Boston area, um, communities on and along the Charles River. Uh, we actually have a third zone which is in green and that's zone C. We only have a zone C along the Charles River and that is for a scenario in which we have a storm moving like Sandy did from west to east into Boston Harbor. Um, uh, so zone C would be uh, in play only for that type of west to east storm. Um, so I'm now going to uh, turn it over to Mike Russ who's going to talk about some of the planning activities we already have underway. Thank you, Director. Uh, for the last several years, MEMA has coordinated uh, several planning activities and initiatives uh, in light of each hurricane season. Uh, we're already underway with uh, coordinating with dozens and scores of agencies and organizations uh, thinking solely about hurricane preparedness uh, and response and recovery actions. The slide you see in front of you uh, indicates the, the typical work groups that we have established. Um, so on an annual basis, uh, ahead of each hurricane season, we bring in each of these working groups to include air operations, communications, debris management, energy and utilities, evacuation and transportation, fuel planning, mass care and sheltering, mass feeding and commodities, search and rescue and state staging. For each of these meetings, again, agencies and organizations at the local, state, federal and even regional levels come together to discuss capabilities, gaps, initiatives, communications, protocols, and et cetera, uh, and really look at the upcoming hurricane season. Uh, for example, if you look at the, the last uh, few there, uh, the search and rescue group uh, will bring in the Fire Chiefs Association of Massachusetts, regional tech rescue teams, FEMA, fire mobilization, the Massachusetts Civil Air Patrol, DCR, DFS, environmental law enforcement, the Massachusetts State Police, the Massachusetts National Guard, Mass Task Force One, and MEMA representatives together to again discuss resources of resources, capabilities. Uh, we'll look to identify potential gaps. Over the last several years, we've looked at uh, several modeling programs to understand impacts, uh, not only for coastal communities, but inland communities and as far out as, as Western Massachusetts. Again, looking at all of the threats that we learned about this morning. So when we think about Irene, we think about, inundate, uh, think about rainfall and flooding uh, to ensure that our planning uh, assumptions uh, and, and really how we think about staging resources, planning the staging of resources, uh, multidiscipline resources uh, are in a, a concerted effort uh, and again a statewide perspective. 
Uh, and finally, we identify follow-up actions. You know, should a hurricane start to bear down in the Caribbean, how are we going to quickly organize ourselves and how are we going to quickly support the communities that may be looking for some of these, these uh, resources and capabilities? Uh, and last but not least, uh, it gives us a launch point should a hurricane start to bear down on us uh, where we've already established those relationships, we've already identified the capabilities, uh, and it's really getting to task uh, and to put a lot of these uh, resources uh, into motion. Uh, it's been a, a best practice here at MEMA where a lot of planning over the years. We continue to build on it. We're not starting from scratch in many of these areas. And as we continue to learn about lessons learned from other hurricanes, we continue to ask ourselves, do we have all of the priorities set in motion in terms of hurricane preparedness planning? Up next, we'll discuss our pre-landfall activities. Uh, and with that, I'll turn to Director Schwartz. Thanks. Uh, before I do that, um, I think we'll go back. We have two questions that were sent in that sort of deal with our inundation and storage, storm surge products um, uh, that I th let's touch on before we go get away from this. So uh, we have one question that says, do the products take into account predicted tides and storm surge arrival? inundation risk will be lower at low tide. Um, and this, you know, we have some areas where we have a nine foot tidal range. Um, I'm going to answer part of that and I'm going to look to my right. Um, our inundation maps that we showed you a moment ago, which are our planning tool, um, are based upon worst case scenarios. Um, so our inundation maps give you a worst case scenario, so we're really assuming um, uh, um, a high tide impact as opposed to a low tide impact. Uh, but I think the real question is um, the forecast maps and the forecast products that are coming out of the Hurricane Center and the National Weather Service 48 hours and less in advance, how do you factor in these issues? Okay, so uh, regarding the, uh, the storm surge products, the storm surge threat graphic that we produce locally for our office will in fact account for uh, different possible times of arrival. So uh, the way the, the slush model is run nowadays, it's actually run in kind of a, a mega ensemble of a thousand specific runs. So for each individual run, you know the timing of that particular run so you can then go back and look at the tide. Uh, there is a website that I will give that I've also given to David so you'll have it for future reference. It is slosh, S-L-O-S-H dot NOAA dot gov, I can get it here, slosh dot N-W-S dot NOAA dot gov slash PSurge 2.0 and PSurge stands for probabilistic surge. On that website, you will have access to all sorts of data. So the, the inundation graphic that comes from the National Hurricane Center, that is the, um, the one in 10 chance of being exceeded from this probabilistic surge run. Uh, so the, the threat graphics we produce will account for uh, potential different arrival times and hence the, the tides. Thank you, Lena. We had other, one other question. How can we get a copy of the hurricane evacuation study? Um, uh, the study itself is a large uh, document um, for people that want to see the whole study, uh, reach out to us here at MEMA and uh, we can get that for you. But the um, perhaps the most important component of the study are the estimated clearance times uh, for all of our coastal communities. Um, I just checked. I do not believe that the clearance times are on our website, but we will remedy that uh, in the next day or two, um, and we will make sure that uh, if you go to the hurricane section of our website, um, down towards the bottom where we have the link for our inundation maps, uh, we will also put a link there for our clearance times uh, so that people can get them. And they're also in, for HERVAC users, um, for HERVAC users, the clearance times are all in there as well. So um, our screen just went. 
White on the button. Anyway, um, the last uh, so the last part of uh, the webinar, just a couple minutes. Um, just want to talk about what you can expect from MEMA and what we are doing uh, pre-landfall in the 72 to 96 hours uh, prior to landfall. What can you expect from us? What are we doing? So um, once we and all of us start seeing forecast information that suggests um, a, a risk uh, that a tropical system will have a significant impact uh, on Massachusetts, um, we begin winding up activities. So whether that, that might be 72 hours in advance, it might be 96 hours in advance, or it might even be uh, longer that, than that. But once um, the Hurricane Center and the Weather Service are, are um, providing information that suggests a, a real risk of impact. What we will start doing is pushing out situational awareness statements to everybody on our distribution list uh, to, be, to be providing you the most current uh, updated information uh, on the storm, the risks, the potentials. And one of our goals is that we want to start feeding you information before you start hearing the press talk about uh, information because I didn't say this, but you know sometimes what you get from the media can be hyped. Um, different channels are competing against each other for viewers. So um, what we want to do is make sure you're getting the baseline factual information. So you'll start getting that once a day or twice a day situational awareness statement from us. Uh, as the storm starts to move uh, closer um, and as we come into that cone of uncertainty for the potential uh, track of the eye, um, we will continue to ramp up uh, our activities. In terms of situational awareness, uh, what you'll get from us is you know, certainly by the time we're 72 hours out, uh, you'll likely be getting at least two products from us a day. Um, we will likely have initiated at least one, uh, emer uh, what we call our statewide EMD, but our statewide uh, conference call that we host at least once per day. Um, and depending on uh, the the certainty of the forecast, we by 72 hours may be doing that twice a day um, as well. And we typically think of doing them at around 12.30 p.m. and 6.30 p.m. And the National Weather Service would also be doing one, two, or even three conference calls per day. So you'll be getting a lot of uh, information from us. Um, at 72 hours out, um, we typically activate the State Emergency Operations Center um, and go to a 12-hour planning cycle. Uh, so we're bringing in, starting 72 hours out, uh, most or all of our emergency support functions and the agencies that support our, all of our emergency support functions. We go to a 12, 12 on, 12 off and you use that 72 hours uh, to do pre-landfall planning. Um, and a lot of that is about ensuring that we have the right resources in the right place at the right time. So we're focused on uh, pre-staging high water rescue, swift water rescue resources, um, pre-staging uh, technical rescue resources, uh, calling up, activating incident management teams, um, getting our impact and damage assessment teams uh, ready to go out. We're working with the Red Cross and our communities uh, at uh, developing sheltering plans, understanding which communities are going to stand up shelters if this storm actually hits us, um, where are we going to have regional shelters. We're looking at uh, the availability of commodities, working with FEMA um, to ensure that we have supplies of food, water, fuel, generators, tarps, uh, et cetera, either staged or we know how we're going to access them if necessary. 
uh, we're activating our debris management, statewide debris management contracts and our heavy equipment contracts so that we're prepared to mount debris management operations as soon as it's safe to do so. Um, we will be very focused on evacuation decision making, uh, working with all of the tools that we've been talking about to uh, be providing you with information to make local evacuation decisions, um, working with the governor uh, to make sure that the governor is tied to evacuation decisions uh, as well, and we'll be very focused on communications and ensuring that our public safety communication systems are activated and that we're prepared to bring in emergency response right after landfall to stand up systems that may be damaged. So uh, very busy place, 72 hours prior to landfall. Uh, once we get, by the time we get to the onset of tropical storm force winds, uh, we will have uh, you know, activated to our fullest level and we'll be in 24-hour operations. So um, by the time tropical uh, storm force winds are here, we're at 24 operations with all of our ESFs and our federal partners. We'll go 24-7 uh, until we don't need to be at 24-7. And I guess the last thing I should mention in those 72 hours, uh, for those of you on the Cape, uh, we're very focused on the Cape Cod Emergency Traffic Plan. Depending on the time of year and the population on the Cape, if we're looking at a system in, you know, certainly in August, we're going to be very focused on uh, whether to activate the Cape Cod Emergency Traffic Plan and when, and working with our partners to get that ready to go. If we're looking at a midweek storm in October or November, we may be making a decision that we are not going to have to implement the Cape Cod Emergency Traffic Plan. So um, I'm going to stop there. That's a lot of information. We're uh, 10 minutes over. Um, there are no questions showing uh, from our chat feature, um, but for those people who may want to stay on for a few extra minutes at this point, we'll open the system for call uh, questions and then Michael explain how to do that. Absolutely. Thank you, Director. Um, so as the Director had indicated, we'll now open up for questions. We are seeing no more questions on our chat feature. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand on the menu bar. Uh, we will then unmute you and you'll be able to uh, ask your question at that time. So again, and all open are now in interactive talk mode. All participants are now in listen-only mode. We will take questions as they come in. While we wait for to see if there are any questions, I'll look to our speakers here. Any closing comments, other comments as a result of our conversation today? I just had one thing to add. Uh, for those who are interested in joining NWS Chat, if you go to the website nwschat.noaa.gov, there is actually an option on that page where you can request your very own account right from that page. So you don't have to email Glenn uh, directly to get an account, but if you want to become part of the emergency manager room, uh, that would be where you, once you have your account, you would need to uh, contact us at box.operations.noaa.gov. I just wanted to clarify that, that point. Thanks, Matt. Any other comments from our speakers here today? And looking to Mike. system operator? Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I just might make two, uh, two points that come to mind. One, and it goes back to something Kurt said at the beginning, uh, there's a lot of preparation that goes into this on many different levels, and that requires very close collaboration among various entities, including the National Weather Service, Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency, uh, FEMA, and, uh, and, and still many other entities as well. It can't really uh, overstate the importance of that collaboration how far we've gone since our last landfalling hurricane in 1991. Second thing is really uh, make this a little bit more personal. I think for everyone who's been uh, trying to absorb this information, 
really would like you to take a, a second step here, a next step, and think about what is, uh, how are you uh, vulnerable? What kind of impact might you have? What really should you be doing now before we have an actual hurricane threat? to really be ready for your own particular circumstances. So you've seen a wide range of hazards, a wide range of, of tools that are available, resources. But now take it and really telescope down your own situation and the types of decisions that you have to make. What can you do now to be better prepared uh, to make those kind of decisions when we actually do have a threat? Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Bob. And in checking for our questions, we are seeing no questions. So in closing, thank you everyone for attending today's 2017 Hurricane Preparedness Webinar. If you have any other questions leaving today's session, please feel free to contact your MEMA regional office or MEMA headquarters. You can contact myself at michael.russas, R-U-S-S-A-S, at state.ma.us, or, or with any of the speakers that have left their contact information uh, here today with you. Uh, once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation. We'd really appreciate it if you could complete that to provide your feedback as we think about future webinars just in general and more importantly on hurricane preparedness. As I noted earlier, all of today's presentations will be posted on MEMA's website. And for the 300 plus uh, individuals that have joined us for these two webinars, I'd really like to thank you all for your participation as we've been really pleased and happy to bring this webinar to you. On behalf of Mima and our presenters here today, I'd like to thank you for joining us and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. We're sorry, your conference is ending now. Please hang up.